So it's really important for law enforcement to understand how trauma can affect the brain because with that understanding, a lot of things that were confusing or they could even lead an investigator or law enforcement person to not believe or to doubt a victim's story because it doesn't seem to make sense to them, if they understand how trauma affects the brain, it really makes sense. If they understand how trauma affects the brain, they can understand why the person wasn't paying attention to or noticing information that they'd really like to have for their investigation. They can help them understand why the person didn't cry out for help, even though they knew there were people in the room right next to them who were right there. They might be having a response we call tonic immobility, when they're literally unable to move or speak because they're so terrified that they can't do so. And if a police officer understands that and understands there's a brain basis for that, it's the fear circuitry, it's affecting the brain stem, which is then making them unable to move. If you understand that, then you're not baffled, you're not confused, and you're definitely not going to be thinking the person is making it up or lying or is not believable because you understand, oh yeah, this is a normal response that brains can have when a person is being attacked, when a person is terrified. And there's so many examples of that, and that's a really important part of the training we offer is to help law enforcement take things that were confusing to them or that they didn't even know to ask about, or when they heard about it, they thought maybe it was evidence of consent or that the person is not believable, and to see how these are actually well-known brain-based responses to trauma. So there's one moment in a sexual assault that is really important for investigators and prosecutors to listen for and to discover and to mine for evidence. There's many moments, but this is a really crucial one. And that's when the fear kicks in. When that person's brain realizes that they are under attack, that this person they thought they could trust is now someone who's going to use them in a sexual way, that someone who they thought was caring or a friend is now treating them as an object and exploiting them and harming them in this way. And when that happens, we know from decades of research that when the brain detects that, this fear circuitry of the brain detects that and the brain shifts. The people often freeze and stop moving to see what's going on and to maybe think of how they can get out of this situation. It also um, starts to impair the parts of their brain that allow them to think clearly and to actually understand what's going on and make sense of it and remember that there's people in the next room who they could call out to help for and things like that. When the fear kicks in, it shifts the brain in such a way that these thinking and reasoning parts of the brain become impaired and even effectively shut down. And so now the person is acting based on reflexes and habits. And so you really want to know in any assault when was that moment when the fear kicked in? When did they freeze because they realized something was wrong, something bad was happening? When was their brain starting to get impaired in certain ways that they weren't able to think clearly and figure out how to respond? Um, and also, this has real huge implications for how memory works. Once fear kicks in, it affects a part of the brain called the hippocampus that is responsible for encoding and storing away memories. And at first, when the fear kicks in, the hippocampus kind of goes into a super encoding mode. And this is why people can often describe in great detail just those moments before that mask came off and he started coming at them and doing something, or just before he started tearing their clothes off or something like that. And just afterwards, they can describe that in great detail. So it's really important to know when did that fear really kick in because it changes the way the brain operates, it changes what they remember, and right around that time, things can be remembered very vividly. But then minutes later, the memories can become much more fragmentary. And so then you have an realistic expectations about how people are going to act and what they're going to remember and in how much detail based on just knowing when did that fear really kick in for that person. One thing that that law enforcement officers have found helpful um, is to think about parallels between what a police officer who's involved in an officer involved shooting experiences in the midst of that and how they remember that and what a sexual assault victim can experience. So police officers will often tell you how they remember seeing the gun, 
they remember the loud sound, but they can't remember exactly how the room was laid out or what exactly they did afterwards. Um, they may report that they they froze for a couple seconds when the when the gun first appeared, and they even though this wasn't how they were trained, they just couldn't help it. They froze, and these are the same kinds of things we see in people who are sexually assaulted. They may remember that moment when the the perpetrator first grabbed their neck, and they realized that something really bad was happening here. They re may remember that moment they froze as they realized they were being sexually assaulted. Also, police officers will tell you that they go back and listen, to, for example, to the radio traffic that they had when they were involved in a shooting. And there's all these things that were said by the people on the other end of the radio that they don't remember hearing. There's things that they said that they don't remember hearing. And in the same way, for a sexual assault victim, there's going to be big pieces of that memory that really aren't there as memory, big pieces of the experience that didn't get encoded. And so they're going to have these fragmentary memories, but they don't have the video usually to replay it back. They don't have the radio traffic. But police officers can look at their own experience and see how they've reacted to a shooting incident and how their brain really shifted when the, when the weapon appeared or when the shots were fired and how they don't remember certain things, they don't remember pieces and they may not remember the order of things very well or the other officers may say, no, that happened before that or that happened after that and who knows what really happened but you do know that you have very vivid memories of certain parts of that experience and you may not have them all in the right order and you may realize there's things that are missing and it's the same thing for a sexual assault victim. Some things get encoded really well because that's where their attention was focused in that terrified state, what they thought was a matter of life and death. And other things that they wish they'd remembered later that you really want for your investigation, they don't remember that any better than the police officer remembers a lot of the radio traffic that he just simply didn't absorb as the shooting was happening.